And we are looking at the life and the reign of King Josiah in order to do it. Because King Josiah was the king who got God to do that very thing. King Josiah was the king who got God to defer the day of judgment. God said, because you have forsaken me, I have forsaken you. Because you have played the harlot and you have worshipped these other gods, I am now going to get out of the way and I'm going to allow your enemies to take over. But Josiah got God to defer that judgment. So even though God declared it, even though God decreed it, even though judgment is coming, it would not come to Josiah. So the question we've been asking is why? Why didn't judgment come to Josiah when God had already decreed and declared that it was coming? What did he do? And we are studying what he did because if you want what Josiah got, you got to be willing to do what Josiah did. If you want what Josiah got, you have to be willing to do what Josiah did to get it. And we said Josiah did three things to defer that day. He did three things to receive God's deferred adjudication. Where God didn't only delay his judgment on Josiah, he dismissed it altogether. What did he do? Well, we said it was the work of God, the word of God, And the worship of God. Those three things. The work of God, the word of God, and the worship of God. By Josiah doing these three things, he avoided the war of God. And so we've taken the last two weeks to talk about the first two, the work of God and the word of God. Today, I want to talk about the third. So I've entitled this message simply, The Worship of God. The worship of God. Now this is found in 2 Kings chapter 23, although we won't get there today. But I want to reflect or uh, teach today on the worship of God. The worship of God. Our world, which includes our nation, is divided. Okay? Our world, including our nation, is divided. And it doesn't matter whether you believe that or not, you uh, want to dismiss that or not, that doesn't matter. The truth of the matter is we are divided. We can say all we want how we're not divided. Obviously, we are better off than we have been, but we obviously have a a, a long way to go as well. And so we can't be uh, afraid to address the issue, address the problem, address the elephant that's in the room, as it were. We are a divided nation. We're divided by class and culture. We're divided by race and religion. We're divided by politics and prominence. We are a divided nation. And all you got to do is turn on the TV or read the news to see that we are divided. So it does us no good to say, no, we're not, no, we're not, no, we're not. We cannot dig our head in the sand and act as if all things is great when it's not. You know, it's like those well-meaning Christians, I believe, have misinterpreted uh, James when he talks about uh, power being in the, in the tongue. You have well-meaning Christians who take that scripture and interpret it by saying, well, that means I can name it and proclaim it. I can name it and claim it. Whatever I want, I just name it and claim it and it's mine. No, that's not what that means. Or you have those on the opposite side of the spectrum who say, well, I can't say anything because if I say something, it's going to happen. So you can have 102 fever, you can be stuffy in your nose, you can have a sore throat, but you can still say, no, I'm not sick. I'm not sick. No, you are sick. (laughs) You are sick. If you're not sick, you don't need God to do anything for you. No, you are sick. That's not faith. Not saying what is obvious is not faith. Faith is, even though I am sick, I know by Jesus Christ, I am made well, I am whole, I am healed. That's where faith comes in. So by denying the problem, by not willing to address the problem, you're not doing anything. So we want to address the elephant in the room. We want to address What we are seeing in our nation and in our world today, the division that we are seeing running rampant. And depending on who you ask, you may get a myriad of reasons why we are still 
a divided nation. But I believe whatever answer is given to you as to reason, uh, the reason why we are divided, it is simply a symptom of a deeper issue. It is simply a symptom of a deeper issue. I offer to you today that the root of our problem of division the root of our problem of division and really any problem that we are facing in this world today is worship. Worship is the root of our problem. Worship is the root of the division that we are seeing in our nation today. I know what some of y'all are saying. Come on, Pastor. How can singing a bunch of songs in church be the root cause of our problems of division? And that's because you think that worship is limited to what we do before a sermon. You think worship is simply singing a bunch of songs. Now, that is included in worship, but that is not worship in its totality. When I was going to church, when I was growing up, we didn't call church church. We called it worship. So we didn't ask people, are you going to church? We asked, are you going to worship? <laughs> we didn't ask, what church do you go to? We asked, where do you worship? Because for us growing up, worship was when we went into a church service. But again, worship is not limited to singing a bunch of songs, nor is it limited to just coming to a church service. As a matter of fact, worship has more to do with what we do out there than what we do in here. Worship has more to do with our life outside the four walls of the church than it does with what we do inside the church. So to understand why worship is the problem, why worship is the problem for our division, why worship is the problem for all the things that we're seeing, to understand why worship is the problem and therefore the solution, we first have to understand what worship then is. What is worship? Well, although worship can be expressed in many different ways, ultimately, worship is the giving of yourself to something or somebody. Right? Worship is the giving of yourself, your affection, your devotion, your love, your time, your attention. It is the giving of yourself to something or someone. And that's why everybody worships. Everybody. Everybody worships. You can think of the biggest atheist in your life right now. He worships too. <laughs> everybody worships because everybody gives their life to something or somebody. So again, the question is not, do you worship? The question is, who you worship. That's the question. Because everybody worships. As a matter of fact, the Bible lets us know that we were all created to worship. We were all born to worship. That is what separates us from the animals. The animals don't worship. The animals can't worship. The animals don't give their lives to anything unless they're domesticated, unless they are trained. Animals only have one thing on, on their mind, that is survival. <laughs> I'm going to hunt for my food. I'm going to try and protect myself from becoming food. I'm going to procreate. I'm going to sleep. That's it. I'm just trying to survive. An animal doesn't give its life or give itself to anything or anyone. But we, on the other hand, that's what we've been created for. That's what we've been created to do. We have been created by Almighty God to worship. So he has placed worship in all of us. Every single person who's been born has been given the ability to worship. But even though, hear me church, even though God has created us to worship and he has given us the ability to worship, who we will worship he has left up to us. Who we will worship, God has left that up to us. God hasn't made robots. He hasn't programmed us to worship. He has given us the ability to worship, but who we're going
going to worship, he leaves up to us. And so why then is worship the problem if we all worship? Why then is, the, is worship the problem that we are facing if we all worship? Well, it's because of who we worship. Or in this particular case, who we're not worshiping. So you can worship anything and anybody. You can worship pleasure, you can worship money, you can worship power, you can worship uh, uh, people, you can worship all kinds of things. The problem is because of who we are not worshiping. That is the problem. In this time of King Josiah, before Josiah became king, Manasseh was king. And as we talked about before, Judah, God's own people, under the leadership of Manasseh, they had forsaken God. Manasseh had reinstituted idolatry, which is the worship of things. He reinstituted adultery, which is the worship of other gods. He reinstituted all of this wickedness where God's own people had forsaken God and began to worship everything else but God. And so because they had forsaken the living God, God says, I have forsaken you as well. Because you have left me, you have left my peace, you have left my protection, you have left my provision, therefore I'm getting out of the way, and I'm allowing you to reap what you have now sown. And thus, judgment. But when Josiah does the work of God, and discovers the word of God, it is revealed to him not only that judgment is coming, but why it's coming. So I'm sure he read where God says, you shall have no other gods before me. And he looked at his people and saw they were worshiping other gods. I'm sure he read how God says, you shall have no graven image of me, of what's in heaven or on earth or under under the earth. He saw that, and he saw all the idols that God's people had. I'm sure he saw these things, and he said, woe is me, woe are we, for we have come under judgment because we have uh, worshipped other gods and other, other things as God. So not only is it revealed to him, that judgment is coming, it is revealed to him why judgment is coming. And so what Josiah does is he changes the projection of their affection. He changes the projection of their affection. You see, worship exudes from all of us. Worship is constantly coming from all of us, but the object of our worship is what's important. It's kind of like that uh, carnival game. You go to a carnival and they have that, um, that water gun game where you take that water and you just hold down the trigger, water will come through. And the object of the game is you have to hit your target. You have to hit your, your object in order for your little horsey to gallop on and, and you win. But you can move that water gun wherever you want it. You can move it there, you can move it there, you can move it there, you can move it there. Water will still go out, but you won't move unless you hit your target. That's worship. See, worship is always coming from us. Worship is always, we're always giving our lives to something or to somebody. But we won't move forward as individuals, as a family, as a church, as a nation, as a world. We won't move forward until we take our worship and direct it toward the Lord God. That is the only way we will move forward as a people. And this is what Josiah does. He redirects their worship. He takes the projection of their affection away from all these other false gods, and they begin to worship the Lord God again. For sake of time, we don't, we don't have time to go through all of it, but I encourage you to read through 2 Kings 23. And you will read how Josiah, he removes the high places, he removes the altars, he removes the idols, he kills the, the prophets of the false gods, he cleans house, and he reinstitutes Passover. He says, no, we are going to worship the Lord God again. We are going to worship the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob again. We're going to redirect our worship. And it was because he redirected his worship 
that that day was deferred. God comes to Josiah and say, because you have done this, because you were concerned with the work of the Lord and you found the word of God and by it you redirected your worship back toward me, I'm going to defer that day for you, Josiah. Where not only am I going to delay it, I'm going to dismiss it altogether. Now that's the story in the Old Testament. And as we said before, the Old Testament conceals what the New Testament reveals. The Old Testament conceals what the New Testament reveals. So how does this relate to the division that we are seeing in our nation today? How does this relate? Well, let me draw your attention to another story. It's found in John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, it is Jesus' encounter with a woman at a well. Jesus' encounter with a woman at the well. See, back in Jesus' day, there were also two groups who didn't get along. There were also two groups that were just as divided then as we see today. And those two groups were the Jews and the Samaritans. Right? The Jews and the Samaritans. They were divided by race because the way that the Samaritans came to be when the uh, Assyrian army came and defeated God's own people, the Assyrian king, he sent all these other people to the land uh, of the Jews where they intermarried. And so not only did they have uh, interrelational or interracial relationship, they had interspiritual relationship where they became a mixed people, a mixed breed. Whereas the Jews, they were pure. So they were first separated or divided by race. They were also divided by religion. They were divided by religion. The Samaritans only believed in the first five books of the Bible. And so they believed in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the Jews did, but it was only the first five books of the Bible. So they didn't worship the same. So they were divided religiously. They were divided by class. The Samaritans to the Jews were known as dogs. They called them dogs because they believed that the Samaritans were lower than them. And they, of course, then were divided by culture. The Jews stayed on one side of the tracks. The Samaritans stayed on the other side of the tracks. And so you have these two groups of people. They both belong to God. They both came from God, from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, both a part of the covenant of God, but yet they are divided. They are divided. Their present state was due to their past, and therefore they don't have a future. Kind of the same way we are seen in our world today. And so when Jesus comes to this woman at the well, Jesus being a Jew, this woman being a Samaritan, he comes and he asks of her for a drink of water. He asks of her for a drink of water, and she lets him know it. In verse 9, it says, then the woman of Samaria said to him, speaking of Jesus, how is it that you, being a Jew, would ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. <laughs> she says, how dare you? <laughs> how dare you, you being a Jew, me being a Samaritan, you come and you strike conversation with me. You come and you ask anything of me. How is it you being a Jew? You being white. You being black. You being a Republican. You being a Democrat. You being American. You being a European. Would ask anything of me when you know what I am. How is it that that could be? Don't you know we don't get along? Don't you know we are divided? Don't you know we don't have any dealings with one another? How is it that you, being a Jew, would come to me and ask anything of me? That's what she's saying. We're divided. Well, Jesus says to her in response, Jesus answered and said to her, if you only knew. Now, I could preach a whole message with that right there. <laughs> if you only knew. Why? Because it says, for lack of knowledge, my people perish. For lack of understanding, they are destroyed. It's because of what we don't know. And Jesus comes to this woman and says, Woman, if you only knew. If you only knew, watch this, the gift of God. If you only knew what I had for you. If you only knew what I was trying to give to you. If 
if you knew the gift of God and who it was who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. He would have given you. Now you come into this well and you are drinking natural water, which means you're going to have to keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back. But what I am offering you is something you can't get from this well, something you can't get from this earth, something that transcends this world, and that is the gift of God. The gift of God. How many of you know that peace and unity is a gift from God? Okay? That's what you need to understand. That's what our world, that's what our nation needs to understand. That peace and unity is a gift from God. You can have all the seminars you want to have. You can have all the training you want to have. You can have all the conferences and all the rallies and all the town hall meetings you want to have. But until you realize that peace and unity is a gift from God, it will get you nothing. Because it is a gift that God brings. When Noah, he was commanded to build an ark and all of these animals, the Bible says every kind of animal came on this boat. So you had animals who were natural born killers. You had animals who were naturally born enemies. You had foxes and chickens. You had wolves and sheep. You had gazelles and lions. But yet, everybody got along on the boat. (laughs) There was no killing on the ark. (laughs) The Bible says the same thing will happen when Jesus comes back. He says, the lion and the ox will graze grass together. There will be no killing when Jesus comes back. The child will play in the viper's den. So you're going to have children leading lions by the beard. (laughs) Why? Because where God is, where the presence of God is, you will have his peace. Why? Because peace is a gift from God. And that's why if you remember the story of the Tower of Babel, when all the people were one, they were unified as one, but they were one doing something that was wicked, God comes and says, if we don't stop this, Because they are one, nothing will be uh, too hard for them. They will be able to accomplish whatever they want. So what we need to do is we need to go down there and take back our gift. (laughs) We need to go down there and take back our gift of peace. Take back our gift of unity. And when God did that, chaos and confusion is what was left. And they had to scatter. Why? Because peace and unity is a gift from God. So yes, we do have a practical side to this matter, but we also have a spiritual side to this matter. And unless you are willing to address the spiritual side of this matter, it doesn't matter what you do practically. Because peace and unity is a gift from God. And that's what he is offering this woman. He's coming to this woman who knows they are divided. He knows they have no dealings with one another. He knows that they stay on one side of the track He on another side of the track. He knows that, but he comes to her because he wants to offer her a gift from God, the gift of peace and unity. So through the conversation as she perceives Jesus to be a prophet, as she perceives Jesus to be a man of God, watch how the conversation changes and watch what it changes to. In verse 20 of John 4. In verse 20 of John 4, she says this, Our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our fathers did what? Worship. (laughs) Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Now catch this. Okay, follow me. She says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said, what do you mean, you Jews? No, he didn't say that. I'm, I'm just saying, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't say that. <laughs> no, but, but what she was saying, <laughs> what she was saying was, we are divided by worship. We are divided in our worship. What divides us is our worship. We worship in this, on this mountain, you worship in Jerusalem. We worship in, in this temple, you worship in that temple. We worship in this way, you worship in this way. This is what divides us. So what I want to know from you 
Because you are a prophet, because you're a man of, man of God, what I want to know is, who's right? Who's right? Are we right by worshiping on this mountain like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did? Or are you right by worshiping Jerusalem like Solomon and King David did? Are the Samaritans right? Or are the Jews right? Are the Democrats right? Or are the Republicans right? Are the whites right? Or the people of color right? Are the Americans right? Or are the Middle Easterns right? Who is right in how we worship? Is it the whites? Is it the blacks? It's the police or the pedestrians? Do black lives matter? Do all lives matter? Which one, Lord, is it? Which one is it? Who is right? And God is going to tell this woman in no uncertain terms, none of the above. None of the above. Watch what he says. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. He says, you're all wrong. <laughs> you're all, and that's why the Bible says in Romans, let God be true and every man a liar. Let, because there is only one who is right? The Bible says none who do right. There are none who are good. There's only one who is good. There's only one who is right. And that is God himself. He is the only one who is right. So you are only right. I am only right when I am saying what God has said. You are only right. I am only right when I am doing what God does. Because he is the only one who is right. So is it this one and that one and them and them and them? No, you got it wrong. None of the above. God is the only one who is true. God is the only one who is good. God is the only one who is right. And so Jesus tells her, Well, and believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers, everybody say true worshipers, when the true worshipers, when the true worshipers will worship the Father, watch this, in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit. He's not black. He's not white. He's spirit. He's not male. He's not female. He's spirit. He's not American. He's not Middle Eastern. He's spirit. God is spirit. And those who worship him must. If you're going to be a true worshiper, if you're going to worship the true living God, you must worship God in spirit and in truth. <laughs> what does it mean to worship God in spirit and truth? Does that mean I get real holy and sanctified and I start to shake? Is that what it means to worship God in spirit and truth? What does it mean to worship God in spirit and truth? To worship God in spirit means that your worship cannot be predicated or based on anything of this world. Your worship of God cannot be based or predicated on anything that is of this world, that is of the flesh, that is of the natural. If you are basing your worship on anything that is of this world, you are not worshiping God in spirit and truth. You can't worship God that way. You can't worship God based on culture, based on color, based on pews, based on hymns, based on contemporary music, based on how the church looks, based on how the pastor is dressed, based on all of that is of this world. And our worship cannot be based on anything of this world because God is spirit and we are to worship him in spirit and then in the truth of his word. Your worship must be based on the truth of his word. Not what mama and daddy taught you. Not how you were raised. Not how your people think. None of that. It must be based on the truth of God's word if you're going to be a true worshiper. And if you're going to worship God in spirit and in truth. 
what we worship cannot be of this world. And the problem is, what we're seeing is, people are worshiping money. People are worshiping pleasure. People are even worshiping their own race. People are worshiping their own race. But it shouldn't be of any surprise to us because this is exactly what God said would happen. 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 1, he says, But know this, in the last days, perilous times will come. How I many of you know we're living in perilous times? And it's just getting worse. Okay? Jesus told us that. God told us that. Know this, in the last days, perilous times will come. But I want you to see why they're going to come. <laughs> I want you to see why they're going to come, and I want you to see how we will know that we're in them. He says, for men will be lovers. Now, you can take that word lovers and replace it with worshipers, because that's what love is. You, you worship what you love. That's why the Bible tells us, Jesus told us, you are to love God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all your soul, all your strength. Why? Because to love something is to worship that. So he says in the last days, you will know you're in perilous times because men will be worshipers of themselves. <laughs> they will be worshipers of money. They will be worshipers and boasters and even proud. God knew the day was coming when we would have gay pride parades. He knew the day was coming where we would have proud Catholic as a bumper sticker on our car. He knew the day was coming where we would sing songs telling us to say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. He knew that day was coming. That we would be prideful in the things of this world. Now please don't get me wrong that, that with that Last one, there's nothing wrong with being proud to be black or proud to be white or proud to be an American or proud to be whatever God has made you. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, you need to get used to it because that's what you will be forever. <laughs> Did you realize that? You, you will be that for, forever. You know, your glorified body that you, if God has waiting for you, it will be what you are now. He said, wait a minute, Pastor, how do you know that? Well, the Bible says when John was called up to the third heaven and he was given a tour of heaven, he says, I looked out and I saw a great multitude and I saw every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every kindred. There is no way John could have said that if we were all just a puff of smoke, <laughs> if we were all just beaming lights. There was no way he could have said that. The reason why John could say that is because whatever you are now, guess what? You will be there as well. So get used to it. <laughs> get used to what you are. There's, there's nothing wrong with being proud of who you are, being proud of what God made you. You have these people saying, well, the answer is we all need to be colorblind. We all need to just be colorblind. Wrong. You don't need to be colorblind. To be colorblind would be to dismiss or uh, uh, ignore what God purposely created. God made all the colors. God made all the distinctions. And if God did it on purpose, that means he did it for a purpose. So God is not asking you to stop being black or stop being white or stop being Hispanic or stop being Asian or, or be ashamed of that or put that away. Notice in the story, Jesus didn't put away his Jewness. <laughs> is that a word? He didn't, he didn't stop being a Jew. <laughs> He didn't say, well, let me get dressed up like a Samaritan. Let me look like a Samaritan so I can go to this Samaritan woman. He didn't do that because she saw he was a Jew. He didn't identify himself as a Jew. He didn't have a Jew name tag on. <laughs> he stayed true to who he was and went to this woman just like he was. So no, God is not telling you to abandon your culture or abandon uh, your color or abandon who you are, who God has called you to be. It's not, not wrong to be proud of who you are. What is wrong is when you are prideful about who you are. When you are prideful about who you are. And my question is, how can you be prideful about something you had nothing to do with? <laughs> you had absolutely nothing. 
anybody here, God asked you what color you wanted to be before you came to this world? Anybody here? Like, no. <laughs> you had absolutely nothing to do with your, who you are or the color of your skin or, or the people you were born to. Absolutely nothing. But yet somehow you want to be prideful about that and exalt your class, your color, your culture above somebody else. It's because you are worshiping race. You are worshiping your culture. There's only one race as far as I'm concerned, and that is the human race. You fill out those questionnaires, what race, race are you? Human. <laughs> That's what race I am. <laughs> There's only one race. It's the human race. My race is human. <laughs> My nationality, I'm an American, okay? I was born in America, was raised in America. I'm an American. I wasn't born in Africa. Never been to Africa. Don't know anybody in Africa. <laughs> My nationality is American. <laughs> my, my ethnicity is black, okay? According to the culture, according to the society, my ethnicity is black. So my race is human, my nationality is American, my ethnicity is black, but none of those things proceed or take precedence over who I really am, and that is a child of God. None of those things. None of those things come before me being a child of God. And that's what you have. You have people that well, I'm, I'm a black Christian. That's why I do things the way I do things. I'm a white Christian. That's why I do it this way. I'm a Hispanic Christian or an Asian Christian. Or I'm an American Christian. That's why we do it this way. Wrong. What you are doing is you are putting culture before kingdom. You are putting color before Christ. And that's just like we do it in the labeling of ourselves, we do it in our mentality. We begin to put our culture before the kingdom of God. We begin to put our color before Christ. And that is what divides us. He goes on to say in 2 Timothy, uh, after he says blasphemers, uh, disobedience to parents, on and on and on. But watch this. He says at the end, they will be lovers or worshipers of pleasure rather than worshipers of God. Worship will exude from them, but they will direct it to pleasure. They will give themselves to pleasure rather than giving themselves to God. It says having a form of godliness, it may look real holy, it may look real spiritual, but it's not based on God's word. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and he says, and from such people, turn away. Please be careful who you associate with. Please, please be careful who you link arms with. Please make sure that you are joining true worshipers. You are joining people who are standing in the truth of God's word and his righteousness. Not necessarily on what your culture says, what your color says, what your people say. That is putting the culture and the color before the kingdom of God. And thus we will be divided. And that's why the answer is the cross of Christ. That's why the answer is the cross of Christ. I'm not sure if y'all can uh, tell what that is. It may look like ants to y'all, but those are all people coming to the cross. Right? That's what that is. The whole people coming to the cross. That's the only answer that we have for the division that we are seeing in our nation and in our world today. It is the cross of Christ. It is when we all come to the cross of Christ. When we all love the cross of Christ. When we all worship at the cross of Christ that you will see this unity. You will see this oneness. This division will dissolve away. That's why in Galatians 3.28, our last scripture, Galatians 3.28, Paul tells us, he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Culture. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. Class. There's neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. Gender. Why? For you are all one in Christ Jesus. <laughs> I know you have an identity.
identity, but you have a new identity in Christ. Your new identity is found in Christ Jesus. So once you are in Christ Jesus, you are one. And that's why the saddest thing is for us to come to the cross of Christ, but yet there still be division. That's the saddest thing. They say the, the most divided time, the most segregated hour in our nation is Sunday morning at 11 a.m. When all the Christians are supposed to be united as one, divide themselves. To go to the black church and the white church and the Hispanic church and the Catholic church and the Baptist church and this church and this church. The most divided time, the most segregated time in our nation is 11 o'clock a.m. on Sunday morning. When God says, no, we need to be like that. The cross is supposed to unite us. The cross is supposed to do away with this division that we are seeing. Please know, church, unified does not mean uniform. Unified does not mean uniform. I don't have to look like you. I don't have to have your same interests. Unified does not mean uniform. It just means we're all living for the same thing. We're living for the same goal. We're living for the same purpose, and that is the worship of God. And if you can imagine a nation where everybody is worshiping, worshiping the same one, Jesus Christ. Everybody is worshiping the same way, the same God. Everybody's worship is directed to the same object of our worship. Imagine how all of these problems we see in our world will quickly dissolve and go away. But as long as we are worshiping money, power, pleasure, culture, race, and putting all these things before the worshiping of God, we're going to continue to see these things come to be. So my challenge to you and God's challenge to all of us is that we will leave this place true worshipers. We will leave this place with the answer to the world of what will resolve issues that we are faced with today. We all need to worship the same. Worship the same God. We need to stop worshiping all the, all the things that we're worshiping, giving ourselves what we're giving ourselves to, loving what we uh, are loving. We need to devote our time, our effort, our affection, our devotion to Jesus Christ and Him alone. You shall love God. You shall love God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, all of your strength, all means all. All means you don't have anything left for anybody else. You don't have anything else, for, uh, anything left for any other God, any other person. My love, my affection, my devotion, it's toward Jesus Christ and Him alone. That is the answer that we need to live by and give the world. I know what you're saying, but not everybody is worshiping at the cross of Christ, Pastor. Not everybody is worshiping at the cross of Christ. And that may sound good here in church, but I'm about to go back out into a lost and dying world where they are worshiping everything but Christ. That's all right. You just make sure you're worshiping them. <laughs> you just make sure you are worshiping at the cross of Christ. And you give this answer to all those that you encounter as well. And let God take care of the rest. Allow God to be true and every other man a liar. Amen?